Hello and welcome to this course on artificial intelligence for Earth monitoring. I'm Dallas Campbell and I'm going to take you through this course as you discover how cutting-edge artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies are helping to advance Earth observation science and the benefits that this has for citizens. The course will provide you with an overview of the different types of AI and ML, and the fundamental techniques of working with AI algorithms for analyzing satellite-based Earth observations and in-situ data. You'll also be able to work with hands-on tutorials using Jupyter Notebooks, so you can see for yourself how AI works. We're going to cover four thematic areas, so oceans, atmosphere, land and climate. And in each of these topics, you'll be learning from experts who use AI to discover more about Earth and to solve some of the fundamental problems that we face as a society. This is a Copernicus course developed by UMETSAT in partnership with ECMWF, Mercator Ocean International and the European Environment Agency. We look forward to seeing you on the course. Hello and welcome to UMETSAT and welcome to the end of week four of this massive open online course on AI machine learning and earth observing data. It's a really foggy day today here in uh, central Germany and uh, many of you if you're in central Europe you'll be experiencing the same weather. But we at, for this course are a global community and it's really pleasing to see uh, 7,000 people from around the world getting under the skin of what is possible to do with the earth observing, earth observing data that we have and artificial intelligence and machine learning. Behind me, you'll see the, the flags that represent the UMATSAT member states. And this MOOC is brought to you in partnership with a whole bunch of others. So we're working with the European Environment Agency, ECMWF, Mercator Ocean, and we're all part of the European Union's Copernicus project. Now, very, very, very early on in the uh, discussions of what was at that time called GMES, Global Monitoring for um, Earth Observation and, and, and Security, there was a big discussion about data and openness. And for me, one of the really uh, exciting and actually really important things to see that came out of that was the openness of the data. So all of the data that you're able to use during this course are freely available. The whole idea of the Wekio platform is to make the data much more available, make it available to wider communities than ever before. And for me, that's a, a really important thing that helps people like you look at how some of this data can be used in new ways in the future. My name's Mark Higgins, and I'm going to be your guide for the next half an hour. We'll talk a little bit about the MOOC, how it's been going, as well as getting into some of the questions you've raised in the forums and on social media. One other thing I'd really like to point to is the level of comments that I'm seeing in the discussion groups and in the discussion forums. It's really nice to see people answering each other's questions and sharing each other's experiences. And at this particular stage in the maturity of Earth observing data and sharing code and ways of doing machine learning and AI, that's really important. It is very much a community activity. There's a body of knowledge out there that's in journals. There's a lot of stuff in various Git repositories around the world. There's a lot of online resources. And of course, you've seen the tremendous resources that come with all of the MOOC materials. But that gets held, to, held together by the community of participation. And so for those of you who've been sharing your knowledge, I'd really like to thank you for doing that, because it really does help the community to function well. We've noticed that hundreds of you each day are working on the Wekio platform. Uh, we checked in this morning, there were 80 people working there in parallel, and it's great that that's working. We know that um, some of you are also working on your local machines, and that's going to be easy for some of you, so downloading the data there. But we're really pleased with the progress you're making with the Wekio platform and how you're using that. For us, that's quite exciting to see because what we'd like to happen is that platform to be a place where people who are just getting involved in artificial intelligence and machine learning are able to learn, to grow, develop and produce new ideas and things that can be done for the future. Now let's get to some of the, the questions that you've been asking. And some of the general questions we've been seeing in the course are about the sheer range of Earth observing satellites 
that are operated currently and the vast quantities of data that's available. And one of the challenges you're facing is that the data are available from different places and from different providers. So from the Copernicus perspective, so the Copernicus program is run by the European Commission. The European Commission has agreements with um, entrusted entities, so people they trust to get stuff done. There's a whole range of entities, and that includes ourselves, the European Space Agency, ECMWF, EEA, and others. And we provide all of the data. Now, one of the reasons that Wekio exists is to make that step of finding and accessing data, regardless of where it came from, much, much easier. Five years ago, this was quite a challenge, and there, there were the beginnings of the Wekio uh, programs and other DSs of just trying to get the data and make it so it's much more easy for people to get hold of it without having to go to a range of different places. The classical kind of one-stop shop language that we use at this point. So that for you, as somebody who, you just want to get your data, run your code, and produce useful answers and do creative things down the line. You don't want to have to come to us and different people differently and use different data access mechanisms. So that's one of the reasons that Wekio exists. But you will have seen that it's a growing platform and it's a maturing platform. We'll get on to what that might mean a little bit later on. But you hopefully will have had help from the respective help desks. And for those of you who have hit challenges or you've had queries, that you will have had some of the support you need delivered um, just as you need it. The, the Wekio concept and, and um, the, our ability to work with partners in the one place to help you is a, is a big part of what makes the, the Copernicus idea possible. Because we're not just trying to serve the big institutions who can work across multiple data sets. We want everybody who can to be able to access the data and use it. Now, the world is changing. This kind of approach is maturing. And, uh, and feedback really helps. Um, now, we quite often say in, in my part of um, UMETSAT that complaints are good. Complaints mean two things. Complaints means that people are actually using your service. Now, a complaint is usually happening when somebody is getting something and they're getting a result or something they don't expect or something that doesn't help them. And the reason I say complaints is good is because when we talk internally, we really want to listen to what people say so that we can change and make stuff simpler. And a complaint where somebody is getting, uh, having an experience that doesn't really work for them is really helpful for us to really understand what people are really doing with the data. As an organization, we understand the meteorological world really, really well. What Copernicus is doing is exposing us to a whole range of wider user communities, both in science and in services. And when we get feedback like that, it's really helpful to us to know, OK, people are trying to do this with our data, and these are the steps that we can go through to help them more. So it really helps us to change if you've got feedback um, so that we can make all of these services better. Of course, it really, really helps if you're clear and friendly because that helps your message get heard inside, uh, inside places like us. Um, and a word about the Jupyter Notebook examples. So some of you have uh, commented that the running the different models, um, that you're getting results that aren't quite right or don't look that impressive. Um, and one thing I'd like to, to say to that is that what we've done in these examples is given you quite constrained amounts of data and quite constrained amounts of computing resource so that we can have so many people using the data and using the computing resource at the same time. What that means is for some of the cases, you will be looking at slightly less training data than you need to. So the result you'll be getting won't be as good as it could be. Hopefully what you will see though is the, the, uh, the, the beginnings of training. You'll see the beginnings of the classification. You'll see how the code runs. You'll be able to actually get the code running on various different data sets so that in the future, you'll be able to run it on larger training, sets, training data sets and get the results you're looking for. So this, is, this might be why you're not quite seeing what you expect, but hopefully you are able to learn from it as you go along. And of course, do take this code. Some of you are trying to take the code and apply it to different data sets, different satellite data sets, different model data sets. And I'm really excited to see that because that's part of what we're hoping that people will do with the data. 
So now let's turn to some of your specific questions. And for those of you who have just joined us, we're doing the end of week four feedback. Um, I'm Mark Higgins. You're joining me from a foggy Darmstadt in central Germany and UMETSAT. So we're Europe's weather and climate satellite operator. So turning to your specific questions. So Xi asks, ESA satellite Sentinel-3 can measure the sea surface temperatures with high accuracy and precision. Can it measure land surface temperature as well? Is there a problem? So, of course, during this last week, we've been giving you a lot of marine examples. It's been marine week. But yes, Sentinel-3 can measure the land surface. Now, we operate here at UMETSAT um, on behalf of the European Commission, the Sentinel-3 satellite. We make sure that it's happy in space and that the data come down from space and get around to the users. But the European Space Agency look after all of the land products. They've got a tremendous amount of experience of working with land data. And this is something they're really, really strong at. So yeah, you can get land surface temperatures from the uh, ESA data. And of course, they are available to you on Wekio. So they are Copernicus data sets and they're available there for you. Uh, Sean, um, this is incredibly exciting work. Coincidentally, the uh, selection area mentioned in the Philab case is directly south of an area we're working on. Great. In, this is in southeast Queensland, Australia. Um, I'd love to know how we can get involved and please can we maybe apply or extend the test area a wee bit north. Now, for some of you, you will be working on projects that are very, very close to the things that you're seeing in the course. Um, and I, I come again to the, the community experience. If you're doing work that is, is close, get in touch with those researchers, get in touch with those developers, because they'll probably be really delighted to hear from you. It's always good to be able to talk to somebody who's trying to solve a different, different, uh, the same problem in a different area, or maybe facing similar challenges. So that can be quite a, a solidarity exercise as well as being practically very useful. So do have a look at the people who were involved in that particular case and, and Sean, do get in touch with them because I'm sure they'd, they'd actually quite like to hear from you if you're working on a, a similar case but in a, in a different area. Um, so I was wondering, this is Roman, I was wondering if there's a study about the accuracy or the bias of the tags made by social collaboration in contrast with more costly sophisticated scientific approaches. This is a fantastic situation. So, organizations like us, um, we have a whole design process that goes into making our data, procuring the satellites, working with the European Space Agency and industrial partners to get them built. We then operate them, we get the data out, we do tremendous amounts of what we call validation and verification exercises to make sure that the data and everything we say about the data are correct. And as this question points out, this is an expensive choice to make. And one of the things that's really coming out in the, in the 21st century is the importance of using the large scale open science data, like the stuff that we produce, as well as community sources of data. Now, community sources of data come from people who have much less time um, to properly tag the data, maybe, that the quality can, that they won't have a, a, the time to have a quality control procedure. So you'll have people who are tagging the data, they're doing its best efforts data, but it's a really rich source of data. In previous years, maybe um, as scientists, we've gone, hold on, that data is not so useful because it wasn't measured properly. However, whatever properly might mean. However, why that data is really, really important is social data, people, data that comes from people's own measurements, comes from where they're doing activities. It comes from places of interest. So the classical example is if you've got people who have got little atmospheric composition sensors on their bicycle or on the side of a building um, or um, as they walk around. Now these things, they move, they're not quite set up compared to say one of the atmospheric composition trucks that you might see driving around um, measuring uh, atmospheric composition. They have slightly cheaper instruments, but what's really important is they are where people are. They're inside what call, is called the street canyon. So these data aren't just nice to have, they are essential because they're really reflective of where we as people um, live and, and do our activities. But there is a challenge associated with the metadata and the tagging. Um, so 
Is there any study done? Yeah, the answer is there's actually quite a lot of work done here on citizen science work. So if you have a look in Google Scholar, you will be able to get um, a lot of articles on the use of crowdsourcing data. And it's one of the areas of machine learning and artificial intelligence is to do a sort of a quality control of the data, to find out where tags might be incorrect and why and what might need to be done about that. Is it a case that some data needs to be thinned out a little bit? So you're going to have to say, OK, this data wasn't quite correct, it's, you know, tagged correctly, so we're going to have to take it out. Or we'll leave it in, we'll be able to use it, and it won't affect the final result. Now, as you train your AI or ML, you're going to be able to find out some of this answer. So in your own, you're going to have to do some validation and calibration study to work out, does this work if I use this data set? But I'd really encourage you, if you're doing stuff that's to do with um, human activity to use citizen science data sets because they are representative of where we work but the data quality might be lower but the AI and machine learning can help you out there and there is quite a lot of uh, written work that um, is out there in the in the literature that will help you out on that and if we find a couple of things we'll put them in the links on the on the show notes. Anna Maria asks, if we're talking 30 years of a long time series, how does AI manage the fact that probably older pictures have a very different quality and resolution? And this is following up from the land cover videos. There are a whole range of challenges associated with using long time series data. Some of the data sets that are 30 or 40 years long, of course, the satellites will have changed during that period. The instruments on board the satellite might have been updated, and of course each satellite will come to its end of its lifetime, be replaced by another one, come to the end of its lifetime, be replaced by another one, and so on and so on and so on. One example of where that is very tightly managed is the measurements um, with altimeters. So altimeters measure sea surface height. It's how we know about global sea level rise. They're able to monitor it really well. And what they do is they make sure that at the end of the lifetime of a satellite, there is already the follow-on satellite in place. And they, work, they fly in tandem, so they fly very close to each other, so that you can then make comparisons between the two sets of observations. So even before you've done anything to the data, you've got a, an ability to compare these two data sets and see what the differences are and to understand those differences. And two things then happen. One is the data will be reprocessed, so using the best possible algorithms that we have now over the entire data set, across all of the instruments, and also we'll check for any bias corrections that are needed. And also that will be reported on. Because if people are wanting to study change in the Earth system, in the environment system, what you can't do is have problems that come from how we've processed the data. So a lot of the information about how we process the data is in the metadata. It's also in the validation reports and the data studies that come with that data as well. So for long-term data sets and data set exploration, the best thing you can do is use what we call the reprocessed data sets. So they are very long, reprocessed, especially for this kind of purpose. However, for some data sets, you may not always have that choice. In which case, what you're going to have to do is as you train your network, you're going to have to see if you get any of the effects from instrument degradation or instrument change coming out in your training as, as, as you go through your, your training process. So you might take scenes from different time series, different moments in the time series to check that your algorithm is working at all points in there. Because you're right, that the quality and resolution does change. There are other things you can do. So what some people do is they actually downscale the data so that it all then has the same resolution. So they pre-process the data before putting it towards their AI and machine learning algorithm. And it very much depends on the kind of application that you're doing. Um, so to give you an example from meteorology, it's quite important when you're looking at, say, summer convective storms. So you get a convective storm, you get moisture that is made warm at the surface, it shoots upwards, forms clouds, these really big bubbly clouds that then become the summer thunderstorms. At the top of that, you get a cirrus cloud, so it's an ice cloud, it's very smooth, and you'll have some of these bubbles of air bubble up and they actually punch through the top of that cloud and come out. They're called overshooting tops. They're very easy to identify 
from the texture on the top of the cloud. Now, people involved in overshooting top researcher are now looking at me going, hold on, very easy is a little bit of an overstatement. That's true, there's a lot of uh, te uh, technique that goes into actually doing it. But what you don't need to do for this one is use reprocessed data. Because what you're doing is classifying, do I have an overshooting top or not on the top of the, the surface? And so in this kind of thing, it's going to be much less of an issue when you have to worry about quality and resolution. But if you're looking at other things where you're looking at for example, precipitation rates or the change of amount of a surface parameter or the amount of water on the ground or soil moisture or that kind of thing, then you're going to have to be much more careful with the, the data you're using. Moving on a little bit, uh, Charles was asking more a general question, um, but at the start of the module, the classifier using deep learning was introduced and we covered more, and in this module, we covered more traditional machine learning classifiers. In the real world, what dictates which to use for what? Are there any rules of thumb? So this very much depends on the data set and what you're trying to do. Um, bigger data sets are quite often handled better with deep learning. And also when you're wanting to um, do more than uh, classify between a handful of different classifications, if you're wanting to reproduce a, a function or um, what we would describe as emulator process. If you're wanting to map a, a physical process, then you'll quite often use deep learning much more. So if your answer is very, very statistically based, the chances are you might be using deep learning a lot more than the classifiers, for example, the forests. And these are used a lot in, for example, our colleagues at ECMWF use deep learning for emulating land process with processes, which are very hard to model um, in their computing weather forecast. A question from Aruna, quite informative. May I may know what sort of data is collected for the Arctic ice melting and the ecosystem endangering of polar bears? So there's a few things that are used for that. Much of the data is available on uh, Wekio. Um, it's provided by CMEMS and ourselves. And if you're also interested, you can have a look at the OZSAF, O-S-I-S-A-F. Um, their website has a nice little portal on ice melt. And we use several instruments for that. There's a lot of cloud over the Arctic, so it's quite hard to see the ice surface using optical sensors and uh, infrared sensors. So we quite often use radars. Um, the altimeters themselves, they send down a radar pulse that bounces off the surface. We usually use them for sea surface height. That bounces back up to the satellite as we measure it. But they're also very good for ice edge as well. So the altimeters that fly over the ice, we use those. We also use a thing called a scatterometer, which is a very similar process. It has a much wider swath, sends down a pulse of radar energy onto the surface. On land, that's used for measuring soil moisture. Over the sea, we actually use it for measuring wind. But over the ice, we use it for measuring the ice. And that's how we can carry out the monitoring of the ice. Now, we've got an ice record that goes back for 40 years. So we're able to really monitor very, very closely the evolution of the ice over time. Um, and if you're interested, so this year's we've just come out, of course, the, the ice minimum. So during the summer, the ice melts. It starts to freeze as we get back into winter. The minimum comes in September in the Northern Hemisphere. And we're just, obviously, we've just come out of that period. This wasn't a record minimum, but it's, it's up there. It's in the top sort of 10 or so minimum years for ice. And we quite often get asked, will we see ice-free Arctic in our lifetimes? It, it's too early to say yet, but it is, is entirely possible because we can see that from the, the data and the change over time. Question from Judith. Um, I've got a question about the application of Sentinel-2 to coastal areas. Can you name some examples or even better, share a source? So the Sentinel-2 instrument is mainly designed for um, higher resolution applications on land. But we're aware of many, many marine users, particularly people who are looking at coastal water quality. So Sentinel-3 provides you, a, so you've got the 300 meter resolution data, provides you a much uh, broader view of what's going on. But if you're wanting to look at very um, fine scale coastal processes, for example, then, <coughs> pardon me, then Sentinel-2 is what you're gonna be looking at. So you can look at changes in the coastal and nearshore environment, things like erosion, identifying habitat types. If you're looking at seagrass or reefs, reefs or mangroves and that kind of thing. It's also used quite a lot by people looking at aquaculture and um, port operations. Lovely. Right, we also had some questions on social media as well. 
So, how do you retrieve the ERA-5 reanalysis wave data and create rose diagrams for a specific location? Um, I'll just explain a little bit what ERA-5 is first. So we mentioned earlier that reprocessed data that we can make. So with all of the satellite data, over time we get better and better at processing it. The people who run the weather forecasting models get better and better at running their weather forecasting models. They have more computing power, better understanding of the atmosphere, better understanding of physical processes, better parameterization or emulation of those physical processes in their models. So what happens every so often is ECMWF will gather all of the data, the best data they can get hold of, their best version of the model and run it again to so take all the data into the model and produce a long time series of the Earth's system. It's one of the strongest things there is available to study the Earth's system and climate change. It's available from C3S, and you will have seen that some of the data is available in Wekio. And this is what the, the ERA-5 um, data, uh, the reanalysis data comes from. And it's not just land data or weather data here. Um, Judith, I think, uh, is after um, some of the uh, wave data as well. So there's waves on the ocean surface. So you can get hold of the wave data. And what we'll do is we'll post some of these links as to how you can do that in the, in the notes afterwards. And you can use, um, there are a number of pre-existing uh, packages to make the rose diagrams. So these are diagrams of which direction is everything coming from. Um, and they're available in, in Python and R. Um, so there's actually, if you Google Hitari Labs and how to make a rose diagram with Python, um, that will give you one example, or it can be done using a thing called Plotly, if you're using Python. And there's also an R version. Um, so if you Google how to use uh, an R package circular to make rose plots, you'll get them there. There are a few things to watch out for when you're working with the redid, redid, regularly gridded data. It's quite hard to say, regularly gridded data. Um, because what you're going to be doing is looking at different angles and your grid is going to affect that a little bit. So you do need to watch out a little bit. So watch out for the grid that you have. If it's a more complex one, for example, if it's come from the scatterometer, you'll have to do some interpolation, which um, you'll need to do in a two-dimensional space to get your locations of interest. Okay, so just watch out how you do that. And ideally, don't do your interpolation in what's called a, a Cartesian space, so wind U and V. Um, so do do that. Um, you just need to watch out um, for how, how you do that exactly. Um, another question from the social media. I don't have much experience with Python and coding. I'm just wondering whether I have to be able to do what's in the Jupyter Notebooks or if just knowing the principles of them and how you work is enough for this course. One of the great things about the Massive Open Online courses is, is you can take as much from it as you can. And so the invitation with this kind of course is to really go as far as you can. Some people have got time constraints. Some people are here and they're, they're just, they've got a curiosity, but they don't have the coding background to really get under the skin of the Jupyter Notebooks. And that is fine, absolutely. So it depends on what your own learning objectives are. Now, what may be happening for some people is that as you go through the course, you're realizing that you really do need to learn more coding. <coughs> Now, there's a number of coding courses online that you'll be able to take. And also, you can use the, the code that we've got and the Jupyter Notebooks we're sharing to learn a little bit of coding. One of the reasons for sharing them is to get you started quickly and to help you learn as you go along. So what you can do is give the stuff a try. Now, the way we've set it up on Wekio, you can't break anything. So do try it out. But if you find you're getting stuck, don't get frustrated with it. It's okay. So learn as much as you can. If you find that you actually do need to, to get more from the coding experiences, you may have to take a coding course first and then come back to it. Now, in all of the videos, you've got a lot of step-by-step -step guides. So you can, of course, pause, run, the, run a bit, pause, run a bit, pause, run a bit, Okay, which is quite a nice way of getting involved in that. But uh, don't, don't worry too much. And if you find you're going slightly slowly, again, that's fine. This material is going to be available to you for, for quite some time for you, for you to look at. Um, and what we'll do is we might find a couple of introduction to Python videos or resources um, and put them on the notes if we can. Um, is it possible for me to get data on the impact of climate change on infrastructures? <coughs> so this is the kind of thing that we're hoping that um, 
will be possible with Wikio now and in the future. So the data on the effect of infrastructures, so how have infrastructures like road and rail and buildings changed over time is available from certain places. Now, some of this is commercial data. Not everyone can get hold of it. But some people who do have that data, they can come to the open satellite data and work on those things uh, themselves. I'm just checking if I've come to the end of the questions. I believe I have. Brilliant. There we go. OK. Thank you all for the questions you've asked, both in the forums and on social media. For those of you who are struggling a little bit with the coding elements, I can only offer you encouragement. Take your time, have a play. You can't break anything. And if you do, it's not your fault. So give it a, give it a try, play with the stuff. Um, and if it goes wrong, you can always come back to the beginning and start again and use those videos. We'll do another feedback session in a couple of weeks at the end of the MOOC. But it's not really the end of the course, because actually a lot of you are going to carry on playing with the data, using the data, playing with the code and extending it. And we really hope that we use, that you use this opportunity to interact with other people who are on a similar journey and share that journey both inside the course and on social media. So from a very, very foggy Darmstadt um, on a classical winter or not quite winter, but November day with a very gray sky, Wherever you are in the world, I hope you stay safe and I hope you carry on enjoying this course over the next couple of weeks and I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much indeed. Hello and welcome to this course on artificial intelligence for Earth monitoring. I'm Dallas Campbell and I'm going to take you through this course as you discover how cutting-edge artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies are helping to advance Earth observation science and the benefits that this has for citizens. The course will provide you with an overview of the different types of AI and ML, and the fundamental techniques of working with AI algorithms for analysing satellite-based Earth observations and in-situ data. You'll also be able to work with hands-on tutorials using Jupyter Notebooks so you can see for yourself how AI works. We're going to cover four thematic areas, so oceans, atmosphere, land and climate. And in each of these topics you'll be learning from experts who use AI to discover more about Earth and to solve some of the fundamental problems that we face as a society. This is a Copernicus course developed by UMETSAT in partnership with ECMWF, Mercator Ocean International and the European Environment Agency. We look forward to seeing you on the course.